Hello, everyone, and welcome to Leadership in the C-Suite, an important segment of our LMU Business Insights webinar series. Uh, my name is Nola Wanta, and I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy here at the College of Business Administration at LMU. Our LMU Business Insights webinar series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the business and global community. Our Dean's leadership in the C-suite brings leaders who exercise moral courage and creative confidence, who also have a high impact on their organizations and their communities in a global scale. Before we get started, I'd like to just go over just a few community guidelines um, for all of our attendees here today. So first off, please do type your questions in the Q&A window. Um, these questions will be addressed and moderated after the presentation and the talk. Um, also use the chat window uh, for uh, your insights, comments, and so forth, and do type in your questions in the Q&A. And just as a friendly reminder, uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So um, with that, we are very excited to host our executive and leader here today. I won't take up too much more of your time. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to our fearless leader, Dean Dale Smith, who will introduce our speaker uh, today. So over to you, Dale, thanks. Thanks, Nola. And welcome everybody and Kathleen, welcome. Kathleen Hogan, Chief People Officer at Microsoft Corporation. I'm just gonna share a few biographical details. We could write a book when you think about everything that Kathleen has done. But let's go back and at least start with her early affinity for math, cultivated by a fourth grade teacher. She wanted to went on to pursue a degree in applied mathematics and economics at Harvard, graduating magna cum laude. And then from Harvard, Kathleen joined Oracle and learned to code. So a girl who codes, awesome, managed a team building accounting software program. And that whole experience inspired her to return to business school where she pursued her MBA at Stanford, then joined McKinsey and Company, a global consulting firm, worked on a project for Microsoft, intrigued with the potential to combine the technical with the business and in 2003 joined Microsoft. She is the voice for 180,000 Microsoft employees, which kind of blows me away when I think about, you know, 160 or so people I manage in uh, the College of Business. Microsoft is hiring the best people to help achieve its business goals. And Kathleen was recently named 2021's HR Executive of the Year by Human Resource Executive Magazine. And they described her leadership style as respectful, collaborative, and growth minded. She is from the C-suite. She's a mom, a breast cancer survivor, and HR executive of the year. It's my pleasure on behalf of CBA to welcome Kathleen Hogan. Good evening, Kathleen. Oh, good. It's going to go just to where I see you because um, you were small on the on the screen. It's uh, it's my honor to be here. I'm, I'm so excited. You know, I was thinking we recruit at 900 universities you know, around the world and uh, being here at LMU, I think this is a very, very special, special school. And uh, everybody who gets to be a part of this, I think is is very, very lucky. So I'm yeah, so excited And, and to since you've now shared that, I just wanna make sure that LMU is now on the list and this will be the first <laughs> time. Um, but you know, it's funny, when we, we started this C-suite series, the first thing that everybody wants to know is, is about the journey. How do you get to the C-suite? And so I'm hoping you could, we could just kick it off by you sharing a little bit about your global journey to the C-suite. I mean, how do you end up as the chief people officer at Microsoft? Yeah, I'll try to be brief, you know, and, and I think the short answer is I, I certainly didn't, you know, at this, you know, for those who are in uh, either undergrad or business school have that linear path all mapped out at that point in, in, in my uh, career. In fact, I really wanted to go and be a Rhodes Scholar. That was sort of my goal and I got down to the finals and, and I didn't make it. And so, um, you know, that was my first failure, if you will, not my first, but, but uh, one of my failures where you realize there are many paths to happiness. And so Oracle had recruited me. And so I thought, well, I'll go um, and work at Oracle, which is a software company for about a year. And then I'll go back and get my PhD. And I really loved working. I never went back. Uh, after Oracle, I went and got my MBA. And then I ended up at McKinsey, which is a consulting company, was a partner in our Silicon Valley office. And one of my clients was uh, Kevin Johnson, who's now the CEO of Starbucks. Mm -hmm. But uh, he at the time was at Microsoft. 
And so he was my client and ended up recruiting me to Microsoft. So that's how I came to Microsoft. Ended up running our customer support organization, then our customer support and our services business, our consulting business, about 20,000 people. And uh, that's how I met our now CEO, Satya Nadella. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to get to what it's like to work with Satya too, because everyone's yeah. dying to know. Well, I'll certainly tell you that, but just to, to end the story, he was running server and tools, which is the product side. I was running the consulting side. So I was trying to implement the products that he was building. And I, you know, I always like to tell people, you never know who you're working with. You know, one day they can be the CEO and, uh, you know, so always think about that. But uh, when he became the CEO, he asked me at that point, then if I would come and and help him and, and move into HR. So that's how I, I came into HR. I guess it's been seven years now mm -hmm. trying to um, you know, help evolve our culture and, and really um, evolve our people agenda. Yeah, well, let's, let's kind of do a deep dive into that, the whole notion about the culture and, and people. Um, I know that you are well known, um, certainly in business circles and, and across the globe for Microsoft's work in growth mindset. And it's been said that oftentimes a mindset that a person has really drives what leaders say and do, how they tackle issues in a particular way. And I recall reading about your passion for cultivating a growth mindset in a, in a Harvard Business Review article you wrote with a colleague of mine at Stanford, Carolyn Dweck. Mm. Um, in your own work, you've described the difference between growth mindsets and fixed mindsets. And you fiercely believe that for Microsoft to drive innovation, you really do have to get that culture going. Um, Tell us why you focus on mindset and specifically this notion of growth mindset. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's such a powerful concept, um, you know, and, and I really do believe it, it, it all comes down to your mindset. Um, if, if I go back when I first stepped into the role, actually, we were looking at um, you know, things about our culture that we didn't want to change and taking on big, bold ambitions, a PC on every desktop, that spirit of giving, didn't want to change that. Technology being used for good. I know here at LMU, there's a big focus on business for good. That was something we didn't want to change. And at the same time, we were looking at, there was this iconic um, characterization of our, our, of our culture with two guns, two org charts with guns pointed at each other. And, you know, that, that sense of competition on the inside, that hero mentality, that know-it-all mentality that we really wanted to change. And we really wanted to become learn-it-alls, not know-it-alls. Mm. And at the same time, you mentioned Dr. Dweck, Sasha uh, Nadella, our CEO, was reading the book Mindset. And he was reading it for personal reasons. His wife had suggested it in terms of helping their kids. But he said, I think there's a lot of parallels in the from two that we're talking about it. Microsoft that we think is going to be important for us to innovate and to really meet uh, customer needs of the future with this fixed mindset versus this growth mindset. And so we really, you know, I started reading the book. We actually met with Dr. Dweck and really, uh, really latched onto this concept of, you know, fixed mindset, potential is predetermined. It's, you know, this, you have to look smart. Mm -hmm. uh, Failure is an indictment of you, as opposed to a growth mindset that says failure is essential to mastery. Potential is not predetermined. You can grow and learn. And what if we really unlocked the power of that growth mindset mm -hmm. within Microsoft, as opposed to a fixed mindset? And I could talk about the nine-month process we went through to finally declare that our culture was going to be grounded in a growth mindset. It didn't happen overnight. We went through a nine-month process. But in the end, to net it out, we did decide that our aspire to culture would be grounded in a growth mindset, focused on being customer obsessed, diverse and inclusive, and one Microsoft, sort of the opposite of that cartoon characterization, and all in service to making a difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say that we declared that six years ago, and we've been spending the last six years trying to close the gap between 180,000 people's lived experience mm -hmm. and what we espouse. And there's a gap. I think that gap is closing. Right. But when you have 180,000 people, did everybody experience Microsoft, you know, that their manager, their peers have a growth mindset? No. But is that gap closing? Yes. You know, does everybody feel that sense of inclusion? No. But is that gap closing? Yes. And that's been the journey that we've been on for, for the last six, six years. So when, when you talk about that, one of the things that I think strikes me is that you're suggesting that leadership can be in places where perhaps managers didn't expect to find it. Could you talk a little bit about maybe some of the strategies and cultural shifts that happened that allowed uh, diversity and inclusive leadership and the fact that anybody who wanted to 
really um, unleash what they could contribute to Microsoft was able to do that. Like you said, it doesn't happen overnight, but what are you, how are you training managers for that? Well, so there's, I guess, different things I could go. I mean, from a culture perspective to really drive culture change, we were really trying to activate at all levels. I mean, at first it starts with the CEO and if the CEO can embody what you're asserting and right, having that growth mindset, that is a huge force multiplier. You know, I remember the first time Satya early on had a, a, you know, you'd say it was a mistake. He went to Grace Hoppers, for those who don't know, it's this big women's conference. He was going to be the first CEO to talk to women. It was all with well intentions and, uh, and got the question, you know, if you're a woman and, and you haven't been promoted, what should you do? And he answered from his own experience, which is, you know, I believe in karma and, and uh, you know, in retrospect, it wasn't the right answer because if they're biases and other things, uh, then maybe karma isn't the, the best thing to, to think about. And, uh, and it was such a powerful moment though, because he literally the next day wrote an email to the company and said, I made a mistake. I own it. I'm going to learn. I'm going to lean in and I'm going to, I'm going to get better because of this. And that was just like, wow. It, because instead of saying, you know, who's to blame, who put me there, who didn't prep me the right way, who, you know, picked that interviewer, he just said, hey, that, you know, with the growth mindset, I blew it. I, I, I you know, I, I didn't think deeply enough about the question. Mm -hmm. I used my own context versus understanding other people's lived experience that would be different. And, um, and, and, and I think, so, so you think about the power of the CEO role modeling it, looking at the, the, the corporate vice presidents, we've invested significantly in our 18,000 managers, but then it's really about how do you unlock the power of the 180,000 people back to your question. One of the things we did is we used to have a company meeting where we would talk at the employees for four hours, you know, kind of that know-it-all mentality. And one of the symbolic changes was we, uh, we got rid of it and instead we have a one week hackathon where teams around the world can get together. They post ideas, people from different disciplines, different geographies can come and hack. And then there's a process for the best ideas to get seen and get implemented. In fact, one of the things that we implemented as a result of that was um, parental leave for men because people said, hey, if you really wanna be inclusive, let's level the playing field where men and women are figuring out how to navigate coming in and out of the workforce. Wouldn't that help? And it has been a huge game changer for us, but that's just one example where you know, you're, you're activating the power of you know, the 180,000 employees versus just thinking you have all the answers and you're just going to tell everybody what to do. Are, are there other things, uh, different kinds of training or mentoring that you provide to managers that they can unlock that potential in the workforce? Absolutely. So in addition to spending a lot of time <clears throat> defining our culture, one of the things we spend a lot of time on is what is the unique role of a manager? We also came up with what's the, what's the unique role of a leader? So I can go through our leadership principles. We have three of them, but for a manager, like, uh, you know, we're, we're, versus the leadership of principles apply to everybody. Anybody can be a leader, even if you're an IC, an individual contributor. But if you're going to manage people, mm -hmm. we said there are three things we really want you to focus on. Role model, like role model the culture, role model uh, you know, that sense of purpose with our mission. Coach, you know, help the team coach. Um, but the third dimension was care. You know, if you're going to step up to be a people manager, you have to care. You have to care about helping people realize their potential, not be their best friend, but care about helping them realize their potential. And I'll tell you, we, so we went through a lot of training on that. We took people to off sites and really focused on really getting in touch with their purpose and their sense of meaning and why they are a manager. And I think that really served us well during COVID where we really, really had to rely on our managers to model, to role model this whole new way of working, to coach the team, to prioritize, but above all, to care, to care to understand what's happening in everybody's life. Who's isolated, who just moved here to work at Microsoft and has never met their team and is feeling terrible. Who's got three kids at home and they're trying to juggle that with their kids getting in and off these, Zoom calls or what we prefer, the Teams calls. So, you know, um, we, we use both here at LMU and some of us have absolutely depended on MS Teams as well. As Zoom. I know, and, and, I, and I certainly appreciate that. But, you know, <laughs> what, what, however you were connecting, um, but really having that, that manager being, being that lifeline. I mean, the other thing is we onboarded 30,000 people uh, virtually 
or so far we've onboarded 30. Uh, and this is over the last 18 months of COVID. The last 18 months. And, um, and yet our onboarding scores actually miraculously went up. Now, one option is the bar was just low amidst COVID. People were just grateful. But we also believe that managers had to be way more intentional because mm-hmm. we couldn't rely on the coffee, you know, being around the water coolers and all the things that you would get by osmosis. You really had to rely on the manager. So, yeah, I think a lot of the first being clear on what we expect from managers and then the training and the reinforcement to help managers, I think, has been really important. And it's not just training. One of the things I try to do is send managers mails and try to keep it simple for them, but net out some of the key things. Like I'll take an example. We were really looking at mental health. Mm -hmm. And so going out to managers and just curating, here are all of our resources, but make sure you're talking to employees that it's okay not to be okay. You know, if somebody broke their leg, they would go get help, but make sure if they're having mental, you know, that they think of it the same way. And we went on this big campaign on it's okay not to be okay. Here are all the resources. And I got several messages from employees that said, if it weren't for my manager, I wouldn't have taken advantage because I wouldn't have thought it was okay. But my manager role modeling and caring, you know, made made such a big difference. They were pushing it out. Absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting, you talked a little bit about technology for good and, and, and the, the, the attitude of this, this caring mindset, this growth mindset. Um, and, and you know, you and I have talked about the mission in CBA is to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with this moral courage, creative confidence to be a force for good. Um, as a leader with your breadth and depth of experience, would you be able to share some of the critical moments in your career where you had to take that deep breath and really use that moral courage or creative confidence, not being afraid to fail or take an ethical position. And it was a little scary. <laughs> yes, I'm sure there, there are many, if I think of it. Um, you know, and, and, and there's sort of the, you know, I'm thinking about the ones that you might say were more moral and ethical versus which ones were just hard because I knew not everybody would agree with it. I mean, one thing with 180,000 people, even if 95% agree, you know, there's the 5% that don't, and that's still a large number of emails you can receive oh, I can uh, when, when you have 180,000 people. And, you know, one of the things Sasha's is so great at is saying, you know, look for the signal amidst the noise. And, and that's a, a skill that uh, in this job has been, you know, he's really helped me with that because, you know, you can, you can, you can rotate on the noise versus, you know, look for the signal and, and then move forward. Um, you know, certainly if I think about the early days of COVID, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we were, and we were moving so fast. It's like, you're waking up at six in the morning, reading the, you know, reading, trying to read all the newspapers, what's going on, make decisions. And you were in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, we were in the Seattle, kind of on the, you know, as the, you know, as the wave was coming, you know, and I remember talking to folks in the Midwest early on going, wow. And they were saying, what are you talking about? We're going to go on our spring break. And I'm like, hey, people, this is coming. Uh, and then, and then of course it, it, it soon, it soon came. But like in the very beginning, I remember we had our first COVID case. And it was, you know, from a privacy perspective, people didn't want us to share who it was. But then there were people that were saying from a safety perspective, you really do need to share. Yeah. And, you know, trying to find the right balance and coming out with, we will tell folks in the building that there's been a case in the building, but we're not going to tell you the name of the person and the, you know, the literal office that they sit in. And so those were some, some that would be one example where, uh, you know, just, figuring out your own true north and making the decision, knowing that you had people on either side pushing you both ways. I will tell you one of the things we did though uh, with COVID is we set up daily calls with Sacha and his core team. And I'll tell you the power of diversity makes a huge difference. I wasn't having to make those decisions on my own. It was, you know, I was doing a lot of the research, but then coming to that team daily, having to make those decisions um, made a huge difference. You know, the power of having a, 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 a team and a diverse team, I think made a big difference. I mean, I, I can talk about a, another, you know, challenging situation was, um, you know, during the Me Too mo- movement, uh, people coming forward and saying, you know, I feel that, you know, HR is, you know, I had one all hands. This is back when we would, <laughs> be in person right. you know, and, and said, you know, I feel like you're more on the side of the employee versus the manager when it comes to investigations and which side are you really on? Mm. And I'm like, I'm on both sides because right. the employee and the manager are both employees. And my right. goal is to try to be fair to everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but if somebody really feels like they've gone through the process, I will meet with you. And I ended up meeting with, um, 
you know, several, you know, probably 20, 25 folks who, you know, throughout their career at Microsoft felt like the process could have been improved. And we ended up making changes to our investigation process based on that. So if somebody brings forth, uh, you know, a complaint, having an employee relations team that pairs both with the employee and the person being accused, walking both folks through the process, making sure we're transparent, making sure we communicate. So by trying to take that, that, that moment, have that growth mindset, be open to, okay, what are the things that we could improve on? Um, you know, I, I would say that was one moment. I, I could keep going. There was another- no, no, you know, I, and, and I could keep listening. I think we would be here all night. I mean, I'm lucky I get to have dinner with you after this, but I should probably get to some of the other things that we wanted to talk about. But, it, but it's interesting when you, when you share about uh, the difficulties of balancing both sides and, and, and the importance of how growth mindset really helps you to manage that process. Um, one of the things that Microsoft's really good at, particularly around product development and new ideas that are coming out is encouraging smart risks. Mm -hmm. um, so the other side of our, our, our admission, besides having moral courage, is the notion of creative confidence, which in a lot of ways is about not being afraid to take a, a smart risk. In other words, mitigate disaster, but you still want people to not be afraid to try new things. And, and, and clearly you all have done a lot of that, particularly through COVID. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how do you encourage um, others, how do you encourage different divisions and units to take smart risks and still have a successful career um, at Microsoft? It's such a great question. And going back to that um, early days where we were getting advice from Dr. Dweck, one of the things when I was talking about growth mindset, everybody would say, well, how can you have a growth mindset and accountability? Right, because if it's like, hey, everybody can take risks and fail, and at the end of the day, if you don't hit your quota, you're out of here. How does that really compose? And you know, Dr. Dweck uh, met with our managers and gave, gave, I thought, really great advice, which is, of course, you want people to take risks and succeed, <laughs> and you really want to celebrate that. But you also want people to take risks, fail, and get you closer to the goalpost because they've learned mm -hmm. and they're getting you closer to the goalpost, and you want to celebrate that and talk about that. And you want to reward that more so than the person who's taking no risk and just playing it safe. And certainly you want to reward that person more than the person over here who's just always taking risks and failing all the time. And so really thinking about that in terms of building that into our rewards, in terms of how managers think about rewards, but also how managers talk, right? We really change. So in our managers talk about, of course, the person who was successful, but also talk about the person who took risk, failed, and they learned. I remember one iconic example is we were, we came out with this, I don't know if you call it a bot at the time, but it was called Tay, where um, uh, we, we launched it and uh, on the internet and it was supposed to be showcasing our artificial intelligence and machine learning and everything. And unfortunately within a, uh, an hour, some very bad people had reverse engineered how to get Tay to say awful things, right? And so we had immediately shut it down. And I remember Sacha went, met with the team and said, I stand with you. You guys are trying to take on big, bold ambitions. We failed, but we're going to learn and we're going to get better as a result of that. And so I think it's so important how you, you know, the stories you tell and how you as a manager support people when they take risk and fail. Um, you know, otherwise people won't do that. You know, it's really about creating that psychological safety for people to, to take risks. So I'll give you one last example. I was meeting with Charlie Bell today. We just hired him several months ago to run our security group. And he was literally this morning saying, I love the fact that the people I meet with really have a growth mindset. And he said, one of the things that's gonna be so key for security is we're gonna have these blameless postmortems, right? Because in security, there are gonna be issues. It's like, if you're a firefighter, they're gonna be fires. But if you go into the postmortem with everybody being scared about who's gonna be blamed, who let this happen versus, no, no, let's just look at it from all angles so we can learn and prevent the threat in the future. Um, you know, that, that would be another just tactical example of how the manager can set the tone for people to feel like they can learn and grow and fail versus, you know, I'm gonna be blamed, humiliated, shamed, et cetera. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, and it, it, it leads to, when I think about what has happened during COVID and how often different businesses around the country have had to pivot you know, how do you get leaders to develop their workforce to all of a sudden support those new business directions you have to go in? And certainly a culture of growth mindset helps. 
are there other ways that we, we help people sort of change direction or particularly if we're so used to doing things in one particular way? Um, you mean specific to hybrid or just in general from a culture? Well, certainly moving to hybrid. One of the things you and I talked about uh, earlier before we got on the call was that you think you know, business at Microsoft is never going to be everybody back again. So yeah. that it's going to be more of a hybrid thing. Um, how do you develop a workforce to support all of that? Or are you finding that that's actually welcome? I think so just speaking to hybrid for a second, you know, we definitely feel that we're in the process of moving to hybrid because a lot of us have had the privilege of working from home. I mean, first I'll leave with at Microsoft, we do have workers who've had to be in the data center or, you know, had to be in, uh, you know, on site at retail. But the majority of us have had the privilege of getting to, to work from home. And in Seattle, we're not in stage six yet. So some of us are coming in the office, but uh, we haven't really crossed the chasm where we're really in the hybrid model. But what we've said is we're certainly not going to go back to the way it is or way it was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, where everybody's in the office. And if you're not in the office and you're the one remote worker, you have a second class experience. Mm -hmm. But we also don't think we want to stay remote forever. We think that. We need to have time together and that's going to be important, but also we think we've broke open flexibility in a way that's going to be great for uh, inclusion and great for our talent. And so we envision this third new way of working, which is hybrid. Right. And, and what we've really said is that, you know, I, you know, just even from a tactical perspective, when we go back, we're all still going to keep our video on. We're all going to still use chat. So the folks that are remote still have that experience, but those of us in the room still have the, the fun of turning to your neighbor and having the jokes and connecting in the hallway and all the things that we really miss. So um, that's what we're really trying to unlock with our technology is this new hybrid model right, where some people can be in person, some people are remote, but everybody feels included. And I think that's really the, the thing we're gonna have to be very intentional about because when everybody's remote, everybody's having the same experience, but when some are remote and some are not, how do you have everybody feel included? I think that's really what we're trying to focus on. Uh, unlocking with our technology. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. In fact, for all of our students in the room, and obviously everybody wanted to come back and be in person in class, but there are still going to be those hybrid moments that, that that make sense. And it's nice to hear that you know, some of our best organizations around the world are actually pursuing this very strategically. I would say, I think everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but you know, I meet with my peers a lot. I just had the CHRO summit last week and two weeks before that, Sacha had the CEO summit. And I think the majority, if not most people are recognizing that the world has changed. <laughs> and so if you think you're gonna go back to the way it was and, and still retain the talent who is loving flexibility, um, that I think you're going to be disadvantaged. So I think most people are, are figuring out how do I navigate this, this hybrid model? While at the same time, you know, I remember a year ago, people wanted me to come out and say, everybody can work from home forever. <laughs> and, and, you know, that talk about moral courage. I was like, okay, I'm not going to come out and say that. But there's a, you know, there, there was a certain, for, you know, be a thought leader, come out, assert that. And I thought, I don't, I don't think that's the right answer. I think that, and what we've said to our employees is, we're going to try to provide as much flexibility as we can. And you also have to not just be me focused, but also team focused, right? right. What's right. best for you, but also then recognize what's best for the team and then try to find the compromise, right? Where we try to find as much flexibility as we can while also um, recognizing for the team and the team norms, there are certain things that we, we're going to have to, to do as a team. Yeah, and in, in many ways, that's making the business case for the flexibility. It's not an accommodation strategy. It's a, it's a strategically good for the business. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yeah. No, I'm really excited. We're tapping into talent in, a very, in, in, in very different ways, I think, because of the flexibility. You know, if you have to come to the office once a week, once a month, um, it just opens up a lot more options for people. So are you finding that this strategy is going to result in a more diverse leadership? In other words, oftentimes the, the, the scary part when we were in person is if you weren't always around and people didn't see what you were doing, you know, they tended to manage FaceTime, right? Um, and then maybe if you weren't able to do that or you had to leave the office at a particular time to pick up the kids or to volunteer at a community organization, then you weren't perceived as being serious about your job. Did those folks have chances to be leaders in this new hybrid world you're describing? 
No, I think so. I think I think it, the, the, you know, the, we did this research project where people used to think working from home meant you were goofing off. And I think that's changed. You're, you, people are clearly working from home, being productive. They're not goofing off. And so I think that that mindset has really changed. And certainly with different locations, it's opened up you know, different uh, uh, from a diversity perspective, people who like to live in different locations, et cetera. It's, help, it's helped with that. You know, for parents who may want to have more flexibility, it's opened up that. But you know, it's been really interesting. We have all these uh, employee resource groups. Our uh, disability ERG has really talked about how great it is for folks with dif different abilities to have a lot more flexibility, to work from home, to have the um, the transcription, to have all of the things that they can have in this model that helps them. Um, I think we're seeing just much more um, applications from that dimension as well, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. you know, feeling like I can do the job here and be successful versus I have to come in five days a week. I have to walk the stairs. I have to X, Y, Z. Well, really focuses leaders on recognizing the work product, not just FaceTime per se. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that, well, that's, yeah, for sure. We, you know, are we still going to be productive when I can't see, yeah. and 18 months later, we've had to get over that. Yeah. <laughs> no, in fact, I think that's one of the best things that's happened in the business environment as a business dean is recognizing that. So let me switch gears a little bit. Um, earlier, you, you used the phrase, I loved it, uh, you know, your, your true north. And, um, I'm, I'm a huge uh, Bill fan. Um, that was one of my favorite. I still keep a compass on my desk. <laughs> um, so, and of course, m m many of us in here at CBA really are focused on business as a force for good. How does that play out at Microsoft? How do you inculcate a passion for doing the right thing with 180,000 employees across the globe? It starts with two things, you know, your mission and your values. So as much as we spend a lot of time on our culture, um, <clears throat> And really defining our aspire to culture during that time frame, we equally spent time on our mission. I, I, I talk to everybody. I say, if you, your culture has to be in service to a mission. Culture for culture's sake makes no sense. It has to be in service to your mission. And so we spent a lot of time on, on our mission, which is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. But then we spent a lot of time trying to bring that to life because you could put those words on the wall and maybe you know people would view it as a Dilbert cartoon and everybody wants to empower everybody. So how do you really make it visceral? One of the things we did when we had our first offsite as a leadership team, this was the first time we met without computers, you know, sitting in comfy chairs and really talking about at the end of the day, when we meet our maker, right? What's it all mean? What, what matters to each of us? And then backing into that, what can be the purpose that Microsoft, that, you know, that platform also is consistent with our own purpose. And if you can have that overlap, you know, wow, wouldn't that be wonderful? And so we spent a lot of time coming up with the mission. Mm -hmm. And then one of the commitments we said is every Friday, we meet every Friday, is we are going to have what we call the research is amazing. And it's one of the traditions we've kept all these years. The research of the? The researcher of the amazing. Oh, okay. And what we committed is each Friday, one of us would find somebody or some team in the company who embodies our culture in service to our mission and, and tell that story. You know, you talk about how do you have people really understand what the mission is about and not have it be a, a Dilbert cartoon. And so, you know, you take 50 times six, <laughs> however many SLT meetings and how many researchers would be amazing and the culmination of those stories, I think has people really understand what we mean by that mission to empower people. I'll give you one example. My favorite example was we had a researcher in our Cambridge lab in the UK who had worked with somebody who had Parkinson's and she couldn't write and she was a graphic designer, but her hand shook. And they innovated what's now called the Emma Watch, which steadied her hand. Mm. And so it was a great example. And by the way, the researcher had to have a growth mindset. People were saying, can't be done, fixed mindset, fixed mindset, had the growth mindset. And she with um, Emma came and presented at the Research of the Amazing. And here is literally somebody who is now able to achieve more because they've been, been empowered, you know, through the power of having a growth mindset. And so it, it's how do you make that real? Um, I think is one way to help people understand what the mission is and then want to be a part of the mission. And then the second thing I would say is we went through values and had 
each of our leaders go through the values discussion, asserting what our values are, and then facilitating these three hour discussions where people talked about where do we see uh, us living up to those values and where are we not living up to those values. So those would be at least two things. I think if you can really be strong on your mission and your values that can help you guide you in terms of being a business for good. Um, no, no, I appreciate that. Um, okay, so I did get a question ahead of time uh, from somebody who wanted to know what is it really like to work with Satya and how does the leadership team work together to avoid being siloed? That often happens at other companies and I always get the impression talking with you that it's different at Microsoft. Yeah, I, um, so how's it working with Satya? I honestly, I can honestly tell you, I feel like I've won the lottery working with Satya. You know, I've, I've worked with a lot of executives when I was at McKinsey, I got to work with a lot of executives over those nine years. And uh, I think Satya is, is uh, he's so empathetic mm -hmm. and, and so human. Um, and at the same time, he's so exceptional and visionary and all the things that you would think of a tech leader. But I think that combination is very unique and very special. And so how's it working with Satya? It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's truly inspiring, right? Uh, and, uh, in terms of silos, we meet every Friday. So one of the things that I think is really a, a different leadership style of Satya's versus in the past, which was maybe more hub and spoke. Right, right. It, we really do meet every Friday. And, uh, and even if I think about my agenda, my people agenda is not my people agenda, it's the senior leadership team's people agenda. Even you think about model coach care, I didn't come up with that on my own. I enlisted five of the leaders on the leadership team who ran Azure, our CFO, our head of sales, our head of marketing, um, and now who am I forgetting? Maybe it was myself, but, and asked them to help me come up with what we wanted for managers. So together we're owning that. Cause at the end of the day, everybody has to own the, the, the role of the manager. Yeah, if it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't really roll help. out, then it stays in that Friday meeting and, and it doesn't have any impact on the organization. Yeah. And, and one of the decisions early on, Sachin and I talked about, do we want to run a functional company that really is integrated? One culture, one mission, one Friday meeting, or does he want to operate a portfolio where he has, he just gives individual leaders their, their, uh, their objectives and they report on their objectives. And that would have been a different way to, to run the company. Um, but we're definitely running this company in a very integrated way because we think in the end, that's the best way to serve our customers is to have it composed as opposed right, to right. just have a bunch of individual businesses that show up at the customer. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, one of the other things I've been asking our C-suite leaders is kind of what's keeping you up at night, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, the challenges we're facing now, radically changing world. We have this pandemic, geopolitics, you're a multinational company with supply chain concerns, the sustainable development goals, the great resignation. Um, different approaches to managing remote work. These are all some of the things that keep some, you know, the C-suite up at night. What's keeping you up at night, Kathleen? And how are you approaching some of the major changes you're seeing impact this global landscape? Yeah, one of the good things about being in role as long as you're up less. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I probably was up a lot more in those early days where, you know, I was new to HR, oh my gosh. Um, so, yeah, what, what I'm focused on maybe is uh, certainly this transition to hybrid. How right. do we really have, uh, uh, how do we make sure everybody feels included? How do we strike this right balance between being very employee centric, but still running the business, you know, being very employee centric, but keeping the culture DNA? How do we do that? Hugely focused on how we're going to grow talent. I think we're into thin air now from a Microsoft perspective in terms of the scale and scope of the businesses that people are running. And so how do you roll leaders who can be the next generation of this company is a huge focus. You know, even if I look at what a corporate vice president did 10 years ago and the expectations versus the expectations now, the expectation of a manager 10 years ago versus now, it's just growing exponentially. And so how do you keep giving people different experiences, having those um, leadership programs to keep people uh, growing to be able to to take on and take the reins uh, uh, so that that keeps me up yeah the great re whether we call it the right great resignation or the we like to say the great reshuffle 
And okay. we've, been, we've been looking at this on LinkedIn. We'll see what the data says. Uh, there was a big spike where I think 70% of folks were looking for new roles. It's come down to 40%. So we're kind of tracking this to see was there a big reshuffle and now it's subsiding or is it about to spike again? Um, but certainly that's a huge focus. How do we attract great talent, but also how do we develop, but really retain? You know, one of the things that's happening now is I think Microsoft, you know, because Microsoft, I think, I like to think has a good reputation. Uh, our talent is definitely being picked off uh, or at least <laughs> well, when you're when you're really good then everybody wants to poach well even today one of Satya's direct reports sent me a, a an incoming request from one of our key competitors he sent it to me with a smile because he's not going anywhere but you know just pointing out that the the incoming is always there and so how do you have we talk about the five p's of our value proposition for employees pay is one of them right. you have to at least pay people um, you know, they want to provide for their family. But if you can couple that with great benefits or what we call perks, people that you love to work with, that's the culture, pride, the company is actually taking a stand on things that you're proud of. And then that purpose, like above all people. And I think this is true for everybody. Sometimes they talk about millennials or Gen X or whatever. Everybody I meet <laughs> wants meaning that what they do matters. Yeah. And when you, can, when you can get all of those right, then people will want to stay. But if you don't have those right, then, um, you know, in this very frothy market, it's very competitive. And so thinking about how to deliver on that employee value proposition consistently for 180,000 people, certainly that. That would keep me up at night. I'm focused on. I don't know if it keeps me up at night. I need my sleep, but it, it's certainly <laughs> something I'm focused on. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. I'm just getting chills even thinking about those sort of things. And I know I'm going to be thinking tonight about, am I doing that when I manage CBA? Am I doing that when we're leading faculty, staff, and, and creating the best experience for our students? Uh, there's something there. Let me switch gears for a little bit. Um, uh, one of the things that I really wanted to chat with you about was innovation and technology, particularly some cool stuff that's happening at Microsoft. Uh, we experimented with virtual reality in one of our programs uh, when we were prevented from traveling. So we decided, let's you know try some glasses and see what we could do. And it was kind of cool. Um, and I know MS, uh, Microsoft is working on virtual reality, the HoloLens, which is enabling engineers from around the world to innovate across borders and boundaries using this technology and other things. So I'm wondering if you could share with um, our audience tonight some of the things that you're excited about and how that actually impacts leading innovation and managing talent. Yeah, and, and, and you know, as I said, there's some, there's some just incredible scenarios that we're exploring with, with VR. In fact, I think at the CEO Summit, we really talked about having these conference rooms where everybody's in there as their avatar. And that's kind of fun too, to have your own avatar and, and have that sense instead of a static view like this, can we all be in, in a VR environment where you've got that, that connection? I think that's really exciting. I think if you think about onboarding, uh, there's a lot of application for VR. When we think about diversity and inclusion, one of the things we're really focused on is allyship and how do you have people understand or at least try to have more empathy for other people's lived experience. Mm -hmm. And with VR, being able to put people in different experiences where they can feel more what it likes to be from any of the employee resource groups. We think that's a, a huge application. So I'm really excited about that. But as I said to you, you know, I would say, you know, VR is probably 15%. If we really think about employee productivity, you know, huge amount of the employee productivity we think is really going to come from teams and what we have, called, which is called Viva, which is the employee experience platform that sits on top of Viva, where we're really trying to use employee, employee sentiment data coupled with, you know, workplace analytics data to gain insight that you can build into the system itself. For instance, one of the things we realized is, you know, uh, work-life balance was going down. People just weren't getting that commute time. They weren't getting that break. And so building that into the product and reminding people and having those nudges, you know, trying to operationalize that into the systems, that's something else we're super focused on. And then of course, the, the other last dimension I would say is learning. I think so many folks are focused on learning and moving from this notion that you have to go to class for a month or go to I mean, of course, we want people to go to college for four years, but we think it's no longer going to be the you go to college for four years and then that's it. Right. You know, on the job learning, real time journey, learning, in the moment learning and building that into the workflow with AI and, uh, and ML, we think it's hugely promising as well. So, yeah, there's a lot I'm excited about that I think oh, sure. technology can do. 
Well, I'm glad you said that about you still want people to go to college for four years because the other question I wasn't sure I was going to be uh, courageous enough to ask is, are you going to become my competitor in recruiting students and getting them right out of high school? No, but I will tell so no is the short answer. We, as I said, we, we recruit from 900 universities. We are thrilled with the, um, the university talent. And in fact, we have grown the number of, you know, we used to have a, a program just for our sales right. university folks coming into sales. We now have it across the company mm -hmm. and it's called our Aspire program where we are bringing in undergrads in engineering and HR and finance and sales and marketing. I mean, across the board. And frankly, we can't get enough talent. You guys all hear that, everybody? You all hear that, right? <laughs> No, I mean, the program's grown to yeah. significantly. And what I would tell you, though, is I, I would also say that for anybody who's out there going, oh, my gosh, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I'm going to make it. That's OK, too, right? because I think that there are other paths. We have a whole program that we're looking at in our digital sales where we brought in people, honestly, without college degrees. And we're trying to figure out how to give them that opportunity. And it's a level of diversity, we think complements our college hires and the power of both i think is 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 good so yes if you have you know, stay in college <laughs> get your degree love that and you know and it, and yet and if and if and then yet at the same time if it doesn't work you know there there are other paths yeah. there really are and it's okay and I, and I appreciate that. Well, listen, we have about 15 minutes left and there are a ton of questions here in the chat. So I'm gonna to move to uh, what the students and some of our uh, audience has to ask. So okay. first one says, okay, we're interested in growth mindset. How do you identify that on a resume? So when you're trying to find who's gonna be a good fit for Microsoft, how do you, how do you pick that up? You can pick it up somewhat by looking at uh, if they've taken on big challenges, um, so you can pick it up in that way. We certainly pick it up more in the interview process. You know, if you ask somebody, hey, when, when, when is some time that you failed and, and they can't think of any example, that's usually a bit of a red flag. We're not looking for perfection. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I think perfection is overrated. <laughs> there is no perfection. Like I said, there is no perfection at Microsoft. We espouse our culture, but we don't have perfection. On any given day, people don't experience what we're asserting. Um, so I think that it's really in terms of the interview, I think is really more where we probe for that and see if people have that curiosity, that, that humility, mm -hmm. that ability to learn from their mistakes, not blame others. Um, so I would say it's more from the interview process. Oh, no, that's great. Um, so another question, you've talked about adopting growth mindsets. Um, how do you execute and encourage fast failure so that people learn from their mistakes? How does that actually get executed? We talked a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, I think on some level it is the same thing, which is, you know, trying to celebrate people who, um, who fail but get you closer to the goalpost. We have this model of do it, try it, fix it. And so some teams get into this mode of, you know, faster iteration and faster decision making, which makes a huge difference. I'll give you my own personal example. In my prior boss, it was like, come meet with me once a month, you know, have the buttoned up deck, talk about what you're doing, get your feedback, and then go away and come back a month later. I'm kind of exaggerating, but, um, but it was much more formal. And then I start working with the CEO of Microsoft and thinking, okay, he's going to want to see me once every two months <laughs> with the buttoned up doc. And instead, he's like, let's talk every day. And you know, what, what about this idea? Think about it and, and, and give me your 60% answer. Don't go away and come back a month later with your 100% answer. And so working in a model that's much more agile, uh, I think helps as well to try something, fail, and then, um, and then move forward. I'll, I'll give you one last example. I was, when I first came to my role, within a month, we had outsourced our recruiting. And we, it, we, we were failing. We were not able to literally schedule interviews. The corporate vice presidents were upset. And I had to go to Sachin and say, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to reverse this decision. Mm -hmm. And I'm new in role. I'm not going to make you re read my emails in general, but will you read this first email that I'm going to send to all of exec staff as the head of HR, basically saying, we've made a mistake and I have to undo this mistake. And I'll never forget sitting in his office, actually I was standing because he has a standing desk. I was watching him read it and he turned to me and he said, you're too apologetic. Just mm -hmm. assert you made a mistake. Tell him you're going to fix it, move on. 
Mm -hmm. And I tell you, I came back and it was like a weight was lifted off the team. You know, they expected me to come back and say, you know, who did this, you know, memorize the yellow pages, come back. And instead I said, Satya said, just assert it and move on. And, and that really unlocked the power, I think, of, again, that growth mindset. We ended up hiring somebody from the Xbox team to run university recruiting. Never would have taken that risk. Mm -hmm. But I thought, wow, wouldn't that be powerful to see? You know, and this person did a phenomenal job. But just that, that, that mindset, the way you know, Satya uh, responded when I, quote, failed, made a big difference in terms of my, my willingness to take those risks, iterate, try, fail, move on. Right. Again and again. Yeah. Because if you're, if you're, if the first time you make a mistake, somebody makes you feel badly about that, your chances of taking that risk in the toilet. Absolutely. Yeah, you're going to be scared to, to do anything. Well, it's nice to know that it's a safe place, right? Um, so another, uh, another attendee asks, what do you see are the short-term and long-term HR trends that affect companies today? Well, certainly looking at, um, Gosh, yeah, that's a that's a long question. Um, you know, I think I think that at, at, at the highest level, what I think I think there's never been a better time to be in HR. Mm -hmm. you know, I think if you think about what how people perceived HR perhaps 20 years ago, which was still really important, but perhaps you know people might have talked more about personnel, et cetera, versus truly being strategic and recognizing that your people strategy is equivalent to your business strategy. Because if you have a great people strategy, that's what's gonna allow you to change the trajectory of your business. And so really thinking about HR, in terms of the fundamentals, I mean, we still have to pay people, we still have to be compliant, we have to still do all of those things, but also really thinking about talent management, thinking about culture, thinking about um, you know, the strategy and how it relates to the business. Um, and then the other key element is, data and analytics. I mean, there's such a huge portion of the job now that is about data and HRBI and, and all of that, which is really exciting too. So um, I, I think there's never been a better time, honestly, to be in HR. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's challenging, right? You're navigating hybrid, you're navigating the power, I think, is way more with employees now. You're navigating uh, the expectation that you are sensitive and and, and responsive on lots of different social issues. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I meet with all the different employee resource groups and the expectation has gone through the roof in terms of what we're, what we're doing for employees. So that's an opportunity, I think, but it's also maybe makes the, the job hard too. And Bob, and there are a number of questions in the, in the chat in the Q&A that wanted to know, you know, how do you push for that diversity and leadership position? So those of us from more marginalized communities really see that this is a great place to spend my career, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing I would first start with is we got to lead with the, the why, you know, because I don't want compliance, I want conviction. I want people doing this because they're convicted that diversity makes us better because it does, right? Don't do this to check the box, do this because you want to have a better outcome for our customers because of the power of diversity. And so we've spent a lot of time, you know, really trying to help educate people on the business case and move from compliance to conviction. And at the same time, until we get to 100% conviction, we have done compliance. We have the senior leadership team, part of our compensation is a function of this. We've implemented a core priority for everybody at Microsoft where one of their core priorities is making Microsoft more diverse and inclusive. So now, no matter what your role, you're accountable to say, what are you doing to make Microsoft more diverse and inclusive? If you're a recruiter, maybe you're really helping on the sourcing side. If you're running an engineering team, you know, maybe you're doing a lot of allyship and, and, and helping people uh, from a mentorship perspective. So it's really trying to activate at all levels and, and, and recognize that it's, it's all of us have to make this a priority. And, and the last thing I would say is, you know, I go where I'm invited, but I stay where I'm welcome. So it's not just about bringing talent in. You got to have the inclusion side of the equation. Otherwise, it's a leaky bucket. So what are we doing to recruit and bring in uh, more diverse talent? But then what are we doing to develop and, and retain the talent? Um, you know, working on both sides of the equation. So we have very sophisticated charts that we look at where we'll have for every single level, the percentage of, say, AAB and the percentage of recruits and the percentage of exits. And you can look by level, you know, where, where is recruiting not at the bar, where's attrition above average, and you can then really start to target 
where do you need to be more intentional at what level and whether it's on the recruiting side or the retention side so that you can really make progress. No, thanks for sharing that. That gets very specific, very tactical. So I'm going to ask. <laughs> Go on and on. <laughs> I know we're out of time, but I've been dying to uh, to ask this question all night. What do you know now that you wish you would have known when you were in college? Um, hmm. It's such a hard question because um, I think of your younger self. I know. I mean, you know, uh, probably that it's all going to be okay, but you know, that's so hard because at 55, having gone through lots of things, including, you know, uh, breast cancer twice, you know, uh, divorce, all of these life events. And as you navigate them and, and when you're younger, maybe the, the, the amount of stress that you have and yet being able to go back to my younger self and saying, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, that would probably be it. The, the other piece of advice I got early on, and so I, I don't, I, but I, I would say was really, really good advice. And maybe I've always lived by that is, you know, um, as somebody at McKinsey said to me, McKinsey won't love you when you're old, right? And then I got feedback, oh, does that sound like you're against old people or something? And that's not what I mean. But the point was, at the end of your life, make sure as much as you love your job, work will fill the capacity you give it. Make sure you draw the line and make sure that you focus on what really, really matters. You know, and I, I, in fact, I, had, I gave coaching to a team, my HR team today, my HR leadership team asked me this question. I said, at the end of the day, I wanna get an A being a mom, mm. right? I hear yeah. you. I hear you. I still remember one of my professors saying, what do you want it to say on your gravestone that you got published in ASQ or, you know, some other important things. Yeah. In and, and be really clear on that. And, and some days, and, and I'm, I'm, I, I feel, <laughs> we'll see, but I, I like to think that, you know, I, I've been super clear on that. And so I, I focused on the soccer games and being there and all of that. And some days at work, I've gotten an A and some days I've gotten a C. I mean, there, and, and yet, being super clear at the end of your life what really matters because work will fill the capacity you give it. And uh, it, 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 nobody ever comes to you in the middle of the night and puts a gun to your head and says, your son or your job, because of course you would say your son, but it's how you spend your time every single day that really accrues to what, what really does matter to you. And that, that advice stuck with me. So I got that advice, I'll just share that advice because I think it's so true that work will fill the capacity you give it, draw the line, because at the end of the day, you know, the relationships, your family, that's what matters most. Um, that's Kathy, what I would say. Thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself. Um, the authenticity comes out so loud and clear. Um, I know I speak for everyone in the room, over a hundred people, that uh, we really enjoyed getting to know you as a leader, getting to know the challenges you face at Microsoft, what it's like to be in the C-suite, and then sharing advice that I think will make such a difference in the lives of our students that are in the room. So thank you so much um, on behalf of everybody here. Thanks for hanging in there and listening to Leadership from the C-Suite.